Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our series of lectures in the area of uh, scholarly writing for publication. And uh, uh, we shall be having a number of uh, presentations and uh, discussions centering around uh, scholarly writing for publication. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in today's lecture, I intend to introduce uh, scholarly or academic writing terrain or scholarly academic writing landscape. And uh, the structure of our lecture uh, will be as follows. I will provide uh, uh, academic writing as uh, part of research and science. Uh, discussion. I will uh, go through a brief description of various terms uh, used in academic uh, writing. I will also take you through features of science and research in academic writing. And I will take you through types of academic writing. And then, of course, the importance of good academic writing in various uh, academic works, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in this lecture, uh, which will be very brief, incidentally, I intend to only cover uh, this element of scholarly writing or academic writing as part of research and science, ladies and gentlemen. Now, of course, as you may have um, uh, discovered uh, from the various uh, presentations I've had with you on uh, philosophy of science and uh, uh, workshops uh, on um, uh, what we call uh, PhD, uh, navigating the PhD uh, terrain or landscape, uh, you may have discovered that scholarly writing is part of research and scholarly writing is part of science, ladies and gentlemen. Now, of course, you will appreciate the fact that while writing in general can potentially have various purposes, academic writing, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, seeks to document, academic writing seeks to communicate knowledge in uh, a written form, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, as you may have uh, discovered by now, knowledge can be generated through various means, ladies and gentlemen, and those means include experience, for instance, uh, intuition, uh, tradition, and science. And um, uh, of course, if you refer to my um, uh, lectures uh, I've had with you in the Philosophy of Science, lecture one and lecture two, you may have uh, appreciated the issue of knowledge uh, and what it is and uh, how we construct knowledge, especially when we came to what we call the uh, Laplacian scrutability theory, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, while in science uh, is uh, 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 a means of generating knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, it also includes documentation of scientifically generated knowledge. So after creating this knowledge, we must document this knowledge and we must communicate this knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, it is a scholarly writing uh, for publication that documents and communicates knowledge. Um, and uh, of course, we need to understand that here we are dealing with knowledge and nothing less than knowledge. And we know very well that knowledge is justified through uh, beliefs, ladies and gentlemen. So we ask ourselves a question. What kind of knowledge does science generate? Because we want to document and we want to communicate. But what kind of knowledge does science generate? Now, one view states that science uh, seeks to generate knowledge that is objective, right? Science seeks to generate knowledge that is objective, ladies and gentlemen. Knowledge that goes beyond an individual researcher's opinions or preferences, and knowledge that is grounded in a systematically obtained data, ladies and gentlemen. So when you talk about knowledge generated by science, we are talking about knowledge that is objective, uh, knowledge that goes beyond individual researchers' opinions, knowledge that is grounded systematically 
uh, 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 obtained data, ladies and gentlemen. So, in this view, as you can see, there are various distinctive features of the process of generating knowledge that can form a part of science. And uh, this process of generating knowledge is referred to as research, ladies and gentlemen. So research involves examination of a phenomenon. Research involves examination of that phenomenon by using practices that follow certain norms of science. Now this suggests that um, knowledge contained in science has certain features and remember at the end of the day we are interested in knowledge and therefore scholarly writing for publication documents and communicates knowledge that has been obtained uh, from uh, research through science. So, uh, as you can see, that knowledge contained in science has certain features. Right. It also suggests that uh, such knowledge is generated through a process uh, which, because of its compliance with the norms of science, constitutes research, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, from this perspective, academic and scholarly writing as a means of documenting and communicating scientific knowledge documents and communicates the research process and research outcomes. And that's what we do in scholarly writing for publication. So documentation of research process, ladies and gentlemen, describes how the research process was carried out and how the knowledge was generated and the documentation of the research outcomes describes the knowledge that was generated through the implementation of the documented research process, ladies and gentlemen. So I am going to give you now a few examples to illustrate the role of academic writing in research and science, ladies and gentlemen. So, I want you to consider an example, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of academic or scholarly writing in a journal paper that describes how a researcher carried out a particular study to arrive at certain findings. Right, so I, I want you to imagine this in your mind, right? Uh, so somebody is writing a manuscript and this person wants to publish that manuscript. Or somebody wrote a manuscript some time back, right, and he was able to send the manuscript to a journal for possible publication. So that uh, paper that was possibly uh, 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 published at that material time describes how a researcher carried out uh, uh, a particular study to arrive at certain findings, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see here, various steps in the research study constitute the research process. And the findings that were obtained, or what we call the, uh, the, the, yeah, the findings at this material time constitute uh, the outcome of the research process. So that paper documented certainly the research process, but it was able to provide the outcome of the research process and the outcome of the research process are the findings. So that is knowledge in the form of certain empirical facts, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to use a logical and very simple example uh, for us to be able to follow what we are talking about. So I want you to imagine, ladies and gentlemen, a case of um, a scholar uh, who has undertaken or is is intending, by the way, he has intentions to undertake a study in the area of commitment, right, and the performance of the employees. So suppose a researcher studied how employees' commitment to an organization affects their performance of positive behaviors in the organization. 
such a paper, ladies and gentlemen, will first document, right, that it is seeking an answer to the research question as to what is the relationship between employees' commitment to an organization and employees' performance of positive behaviors in an organization. So that will be the first thing that must be presented in that paper. Then the paper will continue to document the existing scientific knowledge on this research question by outlining a review of the relevant existing scientific literature. Then it will conclude that the existing scientific knowledge does not adequately answer this research question and hence there is an inadequacy in the existing scientific knowledge about this research question, ladies and gentlemen. So based on these descriptions that I've just given you, ladies and gentlemen, the paper will outline a conclusion that this research question needs to be studied in order to fill a gap in the existing knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. Then the researcher will generate some prediction or conjecture about what relationship seems plausible between employees' commitment to an organization and employees' positive behavior in the organization. And uh, subsequently, the study or the paper will describe how this conjecture was tested. So here it will describe what steps the researcher carried out to generate some data and to conclude from that data the empirically existing nature of the relationship between employees' commitment to an organization and employees' positive behavior in the organization. So this conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, as to whether or not there, the, there actually is a relationship between employees' commitment to an organization and employees' positive behavior in the organization constitute or constitutes additional knowledge or constitutes addition of knowledge in the form of an empirical fact to the existing body of scientific knowledge on this aspect, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see here, while the hypothetical research paper describes in this example, ladies and gentlemen, right, and uh, it's very important for us to know what we are talking about here, we are talking about scholarly, right, writing for publication. So there is a documentation part and there is a communication bit of it, right? So I've just given you an example of uh, commitment, right, to an organization and the performance of employees, ladies and gentlemen. So while in this case, the hypothetical research paper described, right, may include documentation of some other details pertaining to the research process, ladies and gentlemen, right, that the researcher adopted, and the research outcomes, ladies and gentlemen, that the researcher generated, right, the above description, right, the description I've just given you, ladies and gentlemen, indicates that a research paper in an academic journal as an example of academic writing contains documentation of the research process and research outcomes associated with the science, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see in this case, science can be seen as a process of generating knowledge, right? And a body of knowledge generated in certain ways. Academic writing, ladies and gentlemen, can be seen as the documentation of both these aspects of science. That is a process of generating knowledge and a body of knowledge generated in certain ways. Right, again, academic writing 
can be seen, ladies and gentlemen, as documentation of the various aspects of the research process that forms a part of science as a process of knowledge generation, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, as you can see, it can also be seen right, as documentation of the outcome of the research process, uh, which adds to the existing body of documented scientific knowledge that is contained in science viewed as a repository of documented knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. So the paper right, described in the example that I've just given you may be referred to as an empirical paper and represents a category of research referred to as empirical research, ladies and gentlemen. So this is very important for us. Uh, let us consider another example. Uh, uh, hopefully, you'll be able to understand the concepts well. Let us consider another example uh, of a coursework paper uh, or classroom assignment that a postgraduate uh, uh, a student, postgraduate management student, may complete, right? And as you can see, this may be an assignment involving a field project that the student uh, is carrying out or has carried out. And here the project report will be an example of academic writing. So if you are given an assignment, right, and you are told to go and describe reality, right, out there, document that reality, provide uh, for example, the ontological and the epistemological variants of that particular reality, right? So at the end of the day, it will result into uh, some kind of writing. And uh, we need to follow uh, scholarly writing for us to be able to document, right, uh, the process or document knowledge and communicate that knowledge. Gentlemen, so the, the project in this case that is uh, carried out by a postgraduate management student uh, will describe the research question, ladies and gentlemen. The, it will describe what knowledge gap uh, the student or the research question uh, could address when the question is answered by the research and how the student uh, collected data and analyzed the data and what was the answer generated from the data to the research question, ladies and gentlemen. So in this example, the project report also describes the process and the outcome of the research that the student carried out. And uh, it's quite important for us to learn uh, to uh, document and uh, sorry, not, not actually document, but describe reality out there, and be able to generate uh, uh, publications out of that. So, in this case, the paper that I've been talking about, given to a student, uh, will be referred to as an empirical paper and represents a category of research referred to as empirical. Uh, research uh, paper, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, I could give you another example of um, a paper, right? Uh, another example of a journal paper or student report, uh, which is based on the review of literature in a particular area to address a research question. So if a student is going to undertake a systematic review Right, or probably is going to review uh, journal articles published in that area, come up with a synthesis of what is represented as a research gap, ladies and gentlemen. At that material time when the student documents and communicates, we are talking about scholarly writing for publication. So that is quite important for us. So a researcher may review various relevant journal articles which documents the existing body uh, of knowledge about a phenomenon and based on that literature reviewed he will arrive at he will arrive at certain conclusions about the aspect of reality under study ladies and gentlemen right so let's go back to go back to our example 
and try to articulate the issues that uh, we are really talking about, right? So if we go back, uh, for instance, uh, if the relationship between employee commitment, that's the example that I gave you, and uh, uh, employee positive behaviors in the organization uh, is found to be significant, right? If the student reviews literature and is able to document what exists in the literature, and if the relationship between the employee's commitment to an organization and employee's positive behavior in the organization is being studied, then based on the review of the literature from the existing general articles, ladies and gentlemen, books, and so many other things, a researcher may first conclude that the existing literature does not indicate right with adequate clarity whether there's a relationship between employees commitment to an organization and employees positive behaviors in the organization so in this example the journal paper describes the existing knowledge in that discipline the journal article describes right what is happening, what exists, and based on the existing knowledge in the discipline, right, the student or the reviewer will arrive at a conclusion that describes the existing state of scientific knowledge and the gaps in it, if any, ladies and gentlemen. So such a paper, ladies and gentlemen, may be referred to as a concept paper of a particular kind or what you may call literature review right and represents a category of research referred to as conceptual research right so when you go to the journal articles and you find uh, papers which are called conceptual papers systematic reviews the state of the art reviews right then you are more or less in that area right of uh, what we call uh, conceptual papers ladies and gentlemen so these examples that i've just given you uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, they uh, 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 i know they are a little bit specific right in the area so the examples of specific forms of academic writing uh, help us to bring out the connection between science, right? The connection between science and research, and the connection between science, research, and academic writing, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, what I've been saying, right, uh, tells us uh, how academic writing documents the process and outcomes of research, and how it forms uh, a part of science as a way of generating knowledge and as a, a way of um, uh, 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 coming up with what is found in literature to be appreciated by the scholarly audience, ladies and gentlemen. So science, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, um, is very important. Research is very important and the research process must be scientific ladies and gentlemen so as you can see since academic writing is part of science right and seeks to document the process and the outcomes of research ladies and gentlemen it seems appropriate to understand a few aspects of research and science uh, so that the nature the requirements and the purpose of academic writing can be more adequately understood, ladies and gentlemen. So it's quite important for us to appreciate the process, appreciate what science is, appreciate what research is, and what academic writing is all about. So let me begin by talking about science so that we really understand what science is all about, right? So the view of science that I have discussed a few minutes later is only one of the views of science but there are so many other views about science and of course uh, this view here suggests how knowledge can be generated and what science is now the view 
discussed uh, in this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, refers to the positivistic or logical positivistic view or natural science model or quantitative research approach. There are so many views on this aspect of science. However, in this lecture here, I'm presenting one view, right? And that is what we call the positivistic view, right? The logical positivistic view or the natural science model or what you call the quantitative research approach. Now, though this is just one of the views of science, it is the view that is extensively used in social science and in organizational studies. Now, in this view, science seeks to generate knowledge that is objective. In this view, ladies and gentlemen, individual subjectivities in um, forms such as opinions and preferences are sought to be restrained, right? And that's why we really talk about minimizing bias. And if it were possible, we'd be glad to know that bias has been dismissed in the entire process. But you know, it's very hard to do with bias because there are so many channels through which bias comes into our research, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, in this scientific process that we are talking about, yes, uh, we discover that individual subjectivities, right, in forms of opinions and preferences, are sought to be restrained. And empirical facts constitute the basis of knowledge. So we'll be talking about empirical findings, empirical uh, facts, ladies and gentlemen. So as, uh, 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 I mean, in the process, uh, you can see here, systematic experimentation and observation is used to obtain empirical facts. And uh, uh, this view uh, suggests a specific approach uh, to knowledge generation which seeks empirical facts, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, these are uh, facts obtained uh, through certain methods, right? Now, of course, there are many other ways of generating knowledge, and you need to know this very well, right? Uh, for instance, uh, other methods of knowledge generation include intuition. Other methods of knowledge generation include authority, right? And of course, science. Now, the reality about which science seeks to generate knowledge resides in the world outside a researcher or a human being. Uh, for instance, a researcher examining the phenomenon of employee commitment to an organization does not have employees or their commitments to an organization literally residing inside or with her, ladies and gentlemen. So, in this case, what a research, right, or in this case, the researcher, or what a researcher has or develops is a belief about the phenomenon of employees' commitment to an organization. Now, the reality being examined is represented in the researcher's knowledge as a belief about the reality. And in this way, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of knowledge about the reality is a belief about the reality. However, as science seeks empirical facts, right, and this is important, as science seeks empirical facts as the basis of knowledge, only those beliefs that are supported by or are correspondent with empirical facts constitute knowledge in a scientific sense, ladies and gentlemen. So science, as discussed earlier, and as we continue to discuss science, requires the empirical facts used as the basis of knowledge to be obtained 
in a particular manner. You don't simply pick, right, bits, right, of uh, facts, and then you come up with a conclusion at the end of the day, right? So uh, science must be uh, must follow uh, your research must follow a certain process to be considered uh, to be scientific, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see. Uh, knowledge in science, right, can be seen as beliefs about reality, and that's very important. So, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, as I've said earlier on, it's quite important for us to appreciate this process, right, that we call scientific. It's uh, quite important for us to appreciate the research process, because before you appreciate what science is, and the process that you go through to generate uh, knowledge, then you cannot talk about scholarly writing for publication. So as you can see, the beliefs that are correspondent with the reality, right, uh, constitute description of the reality or empirical world, and these become statements describing empirical facts in science, ladies and gentlemen. So in this sense, while an individual has beliefs about the reality of a phenomenon or about empirical world in general, knowledge as a part of science is a set of empirically supported statements about the reality or the empirical world. So knowledge in this view, ladies and gentlemen, is a set of beliefs that are correspondent with the empirical reality or a set of statements that describe the empirical reality out there. And of course, based on this, science can be viewed as a way of forming empirically valid statements. And from this perspective, ladies and gentlemen, Science becomes one of the ways of forming beliefs. Remember, we said that knowledge can be generated in terms of authority, in terms of science, in terms of beliefs, and so forth. But we also see that science, right, is one of the ways of forming beliefs. Uh, and um, we need to understand that process very well. So. From this perspective, as I've already said, science becomes one of the ways of forming beliefs. And the other ways of forming beliefs include tradition, they will include authority, they include experience, and may also include intuition. And a person may have various beliefs about reality coming from these ways of generating knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. For instance, a person may have a belief that it is harmful not to bow before elderly persons. Now, he may have formed this belief based on one or two experiences when he did not bow before an elderly person, and then he suffered harmful consequences. So as a result, he has formed a belief through experience as a way of forming beliefs. Now, a person may form such a belief also based on the tradition in the community or society of which he has been a part. And similarly, an individual, as you can see, may have been told by another person whom he respects that it is harmful not to bow before an elderly person. And therefore, the individual may form a belief by accepting another person as an authority that it is harmful not to bow before an elderly person, ladies and gentlemen. So this indicates, right, that there are various ways of forming beliefs, and science is one of the ways of forming beliefs alongside 
tradition, authority, etc., etc., as I have already articulated, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me at this material time to take you to another level that introduces distinctive features of science, ladies and gentlemen, because we now know the relationship between science, research, and scholarly writing for publication. Now, as we have already seen, science as one of the ways of forming beliefs, ladies and gentlemen, has certain distinctive features. And these are the ones that we are going to articulate at this material time. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, science relies on empirical facts to determine whether a belief can become a piece of knowledge. In this perspective, therefore, and taking the positivistic view of science, observations or empirical facts are regarded as the deciding criterion for determining what constitutes knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, in uh, trying to understand this concept very well, we value the role of observations, we value the role of empirical facts, ladies and gentlemen. So this role of observations or empirical facts is reflected in research papers in journals where the specification uh, of a theoretical model in a conceptual paper is regarded as the specification of conjectures. So such conjectures need to be verified in order to assess whether empirical facts or data support them. Only after the empirical verification supports the conjectures from a conceptual paper, ladies and gentlemen, do they then become a part of statements describing empirical facts and get accepted as a part of scientific knowledge about the empirical world, ladies and gentlemen. So science relies on data. Number two, ladies and gentlemen, Science seeks knowledge that is objective and free from individual opinions and preferences. And that is very important. We are looking for objectivity, right? And we are looking for uh, knowledge that is uh, free uh, from biases, all right? And free of opinions and preferences of the researchers. Number three, the third distinctive feature is that science encourages skepticism and beliefs are subjected to questions and examinations, ladies and gentlemen. So science will encourage eh, skepticism. So you will be skeptic, right? And then the beliefs are subjected to questions and examination, right? And beliefs are accepted as statements constituting knowledge only when their examination reveals support for them through their correspondence with empirical reality, ladies and gentlemen. The fourth distinctive feature of science is that science describes to the norm of public verifiability. So this science that we are talking about subscribes to this norm of public verifiability, ladies and gentlemen. And when we start talking about that, we are simply saying that the process and the outcome of science or a scientific examination are open to the relevant community for verification. So the scholarly community, right, must be able to examine, right, what has been uh, obtained over that period. And they are free to refute or to accept the results they are in. So this is reflected in uh, empirical research papers published in academic journals where a considerable part of the writing in the paper describe the methods that were used by the researchers 
uh, for carrying out various research steps such as measurements, data collection, data analysis, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, research, right, is uh, certainly available for researchers to critique, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, the fifth, right, distinctive feature of science is that science uses the existing knowledge to generate new knowledge. So new implications are drawn based on the existing body of knowledge. These implications constitute what we call conjectures. Studies are carried out to examine whether empirical facts support these conjectures. And those conjectures that receive support from empirical facts are retained as statements about empirical facts and add to the existing body of knowledge. In this manner, ladies and gentlemen, science uses the existing knowledge to generate new knowledge. Right, so in others you must know the state, right? You must know the current debate in the literature, right? You must know how far knowledge has developed in that discipline so that you are able to add something new to the existing body of knowledge. So it's important for us to know that science uses the existing knowledge to generate new knowledge. Number six, ladies and gentlemen, or the sixth distinctive feature of science is that science aims at accumulation of knowledge. So that's why we say that in the new empirical facts or statements of empirical facts are integrated with existing body of knowledge. And as you can see here, typically, the other part of an empirical research paper describes a research question that reflects a gap in the existing body of knowledge. And the later part of the paper outlines implications of the paper's findings for the existing body of knowledge. And in this sense, ladies and gentlemen, an empirical research paper identifies where new knowledge needs to be added to the existing body of knowledge and add some knowledge to the existing body of knowledge facilitating accumulation of knowledge. And therefore, the, the description that I've just given you suggests that science, as a way of generating knowledge, has certain distinctive features. And these features of science are reflected in the academic writing contained in academic research papers, ladies and gentlemen. So that is science. And those are the distinctive features of science, ladies and gentlemen. Let me now talk about research briefly. Uh, research, ladies and gentlemen, is a process of generating knowledge through the adoption of science-based approach. And of course, a distinctive feature of science-based research is that it seeks to develop, it seeks to verify and it seeks to refine the theories. Don't forget that. And in fact, one of the scholars, uh, Dubin, 1969, indicates that one of the objectives of research is to assess whether the existing theories are correspondent with or are supported by empirical facts, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why Dubin continues to note and say, that research involves specifying new theories in place of those that have been found to be inadequate for accommodating empirical facts. Now, this view suggests that research involves verifying and improving theories. So, in this case, a theory is a central feature of research. If you fail to bring in this element of a theory, then we start wondering exactly what you are talking about. Unless you are using a grounded theory approach and you want to develop a theory, but even then, you must know what exists in literature yet. And of course, consistent with this uh, centrality of theory in research process, the description of Kellinger 1988 suggests 
that developing a theory is the main objective of science, ladies and gentlemen. So it's important for us to follow through these things so that we really do understand what we are talking about. Research adopts a specific procedure to generate knowledge in compliance with the norms of science. And there are various assumptions and features associated with science uh, which are reflected in the features of research as a process. And of course, as we discussed earlier on, science encourages the use of existing knowledge to generate new knowledge. Uh, for instance, as discussed earlier, science encourages the use of existing knowledge to generate new knowledge. Science makes its statements open to skepticism and uh, doubt unless supported by empirical facts. And science regards empirical facts as the criterion for determining whether a belief constitutes a piece of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. Now, these features, uh, these features are reflected in uh, what we call the hypothetical deductive approach uh, to research. And uh, in this uh, hypothetical uh, deductive approach, uh, implications or hypotheses are deduced from existing knowledge or existing observations. But these implications or hypotheses go beyond the existing knowledge and hence their subsequent empirical verification can potentially yield new knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. So in this approach, the research process involves generation of conjectures uh, to assess whether empirical data supports them, generation of conjectures or hypotheses in the research process, ladies and gentlemen, typically takes the form of theory building exercise Whereas verification of conjunctures takes the form of theory testing exercise. Now, from this perspective, as you can see, research can be seen as a process consisting of two parts, namely theory building and two theory testing. And these are aspects that we shall be discussing later on, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the theory building part is typically referred to as the conceptual part, and the theory testing part as the empirical part of the research process. Now, the overall research process uh, consisting of generation of conjunctures and their empirical verification contains both conceptual and empirical research parts. So every research that you see, every paper that has been published in most cases, actually majority of papers, will have the conceptual part and will have the empirical part. But of course, if you're talking about a conceptual paper, it will not have the empirical part too. But uh, most of the papers that have the empirical perspectives will have that part that we call the theory building part, and then the second part that we call the theory testing part. So the theory building part is the conceptual part, while the theory verification part is what we call the empirical part, ladies and gentlemen. So at this material time, I just want to uh, uh, show you a diagram here that has a sequence uh, of uh, issues as they flow in the research process. And this is how uh, our research papers are written, ladies and gentlemen. So this is a figure that I'll call figure one. And from this figure one, as you can see, I have called it the uh, an overview, figure one, an overview of the research process, as you can see. Now, in this figure here, you've got reality, right, uh, 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 which is in terms of documented knowledge, and that's what we call science, ladies and gentlemen. So that is the first part, and uh, that part is very important. Now, of course, you can see the second part is um, existing knowledge uh, on a topic. So you must review literature, 
so that you actually tell us the level of debate in the literature. So this is what we call, uh, this is what will give you the topic choice and the literature review process. Now from there we move to the research question, right? And then from the research question we go to the theory building and hypothesis specification. And uh, I'll be giving you uh, journal articles that uh, uh, will bring out these issues clearly. Then from there you go to measurement, and uh, that is the scale uh, uh, development or adoption, as you can see. And then we go to the research design. And in most cases, if you're writing a proposal, that is where you end. And then you start the data, uh, 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 of course, uh, 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 data collection, right? And that is very important because you must generate the data. You must collect the data, right? And this could be preceded by a pilot uh, study. Then you go to the data analysis stage, or results and findings, and then um, assessing uh, goodness of findings, and then the research paper writing at that material time. So the diagram that you see here represents uh, 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 some kind of uh, uh, a flow uh, of ideas that you will see in a journal article published or a research paper uh, that has been uh, published. So uh, as I continue to uh, really talk to you about these issues, I'll be referring to uh, various aspects that led to the research process, as you can see it here. Now, as you can see there, the research process involves various steps that we have depicted in figure one, right? And uh, one of the earliest steps uh, uh, involves the specification of the aspect of reality to be examined. And that was really step number one. And the subsequent step is the identification of a knowledge gap and the research question and uh, that aspect of the reality. So this, the, the identification of knowledge uh, gap and the research question must be related to that aspect of reality that you want to investigate. Now, both these preceding steps, like some of the other steps in the research process, would typically require literature review. And uh, generation of conjectures and hypotheses from the existing knowledge uh, to specify plausible predictions about the aspect of reality uh, which is being uh, uh, examined. And of course, that will be the next important step that must not be uh, left out. And this step involves uh, the process of theory building so I'll be taking you through how we actually uh, build theories. And uh, the outcome of this step, as you can see, is a set of statements of relationships between concepts. And uh, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, concepts refer to various aspects of reality being examined. Uh, for instance, the statement that employee commitment to an organization is positively associated with employees' positive behaviors in the organization is a conjecture. Now, it, is, it specifies a positive relationship between the two concepts. One concept is uh, employee's commitment to an organization, and the second concept is what we call employee positive behavior. Now, the concept of employee commitment to an organization represents a certain aspect of the re of reality of employees' organizational life uh, being examined. So similarly, the concept of uh, employee positive behavior in an organization represents certain aspects of reality uh, of employees' organizational life being examined. So in this case, when you relate concepts, right, what you get from this relationship is what we call conjunctures, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, concepts are words that we use to represent events out there in the out environment, right? Or in the real world out there. So when you use concepts to capture events, and then you start relating these concepts the outcome of the relationship between concepts is what we call conjunctures. However, if you move to another level and you attempt to get, uh, to, 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 to transform concepts into variables, right? 
and you are able to articulate and collect data about these particular concepts that have been turned into variables at this material time you'll be talking about hypothesis ladies and gentlemen so the step following the uh, the, the, the preceding step that i've just uh, described a few minutes ago ladies and gentlemen is designing or adopting measurements for obtaining measures of the concepts uh, in the conjunctures to be verified and the specification of the research design for data collection, ladies and gentlemen, is the next step. And this involves specification as to which data will be collected, uh, from whom the data will be collected, uh, what procedures will be used for data collection, how the data will be analyzed, ladies and gentlemen, and so on and so on. So following the preceding steps, the next step is the actual implementation of the research design uh, steps and I'm sure you can still see the diagram here the figure because I told you that whatever I'm really talking about whatever I'm describing now relates to this uh, figure one which is the overview of the research uh, the, uh, uh, process or design as you can see so the, the of course the next step will be really moving into that aspect of specifying the research design uh, steps to collect the data required for assessing whether the conjunctural statements uh, receive support from the empirical uh, data, ladies and gentlemen. And the next step is the analysis of data uh, to examine the pattern in it, as you can see on this, di on th this diagram. And uh, for instance, in the example of verifying the conjunctures, right, ladies and gentlemen, specifying a positive relationship between employee commitment to an organization and employee's positive uh, behavior in the organization the data analysis process will compute the correlation between the values obtained for the measurements of these two concepts uh, for example of employees and the data analysis will include whether or not there is a significant positive correlation between the employee's commitment to an organization and the employee's positive behaviors in the organization in the data obtained from a sample of employees ladies and gentlemen and the subsequent step is drawing a conclusion about whether the conjecture is empirically supported. And this conclusion represents and reflects findings of the study. And uh, in the current example, if the computed correlation between the measurement of employees' commitment to an organization and employees' positive behavior in the organization is positive and statistically significant uh, in the data obtained from a sample, then the conclusion is that the conjecture is empirically supported. Now this reflects the correspondence between the conjecture and empirical reality as contained in the analyzed data pattern of correlations. Now at times, uh, the goodness of conclusion is also uh, assessed and is important and uh, uh, therefore determining the implications of the conclusions for theory for knowledge of reality will be the next step that will follow, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if there is, ladies and gentlemen, empirical support for the conjecture, then the conjecture can be regarded as a statement uh, describing an empirical fact and uh, this adds a piece of knowledge to the existing body of knowledge. And this also provides support for theory, for the theory from which the conjecture was uh, derived, ladies and gentlemen. So generation of new knowledge, verification of conjecture, and the verification of theory are attained as multiple outcomes of the research process. These contributions of research process, ladies and gentlemen, as I have already articulated, right, are reflected in the feedback arrows from the boxes uh, at the top of this figure, figure one, up to uh, bottom, ladies and gentlemen. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, given the importance of this exercise and uh, given the importance of the lecture that we've just gone through. Allow me to end my lecture here, uh, but uh, give you the highlights or the major points that you should really uh, go away with. Now, this was our first lecture, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, in our course that we have called scholarly writing for publication. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you recall, I have already said, now I'm giving the summaries of what we have already said. Now, when you start thinking about uh, uh, scholarly writing for publication, then you start thinking about two things which are central. And the first thing is for you to document knowledge that has been generated. And then it, two, you must be able to communicate results. So one, you document, and then two, you communicate. And those are two major issues, right, uh, under scholarly writing for publication. Two, I've, as I've already said, one, you document, two, you communicate, but what you document and you communicate is knowledge. And that knowledge must be generated through a scientific process, ladies and gentlemen. So therefore, science is at the core of this exercise that we call scholarly writing for publication, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I went ahead and took you through the process of science, right? And uh, I told you, if you remember, that uh, knowledge can be generated, right? And knowledge is generated through a scientific process, right? But this scientific process will take a certain perspective or view, ladies and gentlemen. And this can be a positivistic view. It can be a logical positivistic view. It can, be, it can take a natural science model. It can take a quantitative research approach. And these seem to more or less refer to the same thing. But you also have the uh, other perspective, which is the anti-positivistic uh, view, the critical realist view. And these aspects take us into the philosophy of science which you have already gone through. And uh, as you can see here, in the process of uh, generating knowledge through a scientific process, we attempt to eliminate subjective uh, ideas of the researchers or individual subjectivities in uh, forms such as opinions and preferences are so to be restrained in the scientific process, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, that's why you have systematic experimentations, observations being taken on. Right, so from there we moved on, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just giving you highlights of what we have just covered. And I took you through the distinctive features of science. And these distinctive features of science are uh, science relies on empirical facts to determine whether a belief can become a piece of knowledge or not. If you recall, uh, science seeks knowledge that is um, objective and uh, free from individual opinions and preferences. Uh, science encourages skepti uh, skepti skepticism and beliefs are subjected to questions and examination. I also told you that science uh, subscribes to the norm of public verifiability. So you must be able to verify results. Uh, science uses the existing knowledge to generate new knowledge. Uh, science aims at accumulation of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. So from there, I took you to the next level of examining what research process that you must go through to generate knowledge. And the research process, again, must conform to the norms of um, scientific research process. And of course, in, uh, under research, I have uh, given you the diagram. That is figure one. It is still here, uh, and you can see it. And the figure one certainly suggests a number of stages. Uh, one, uh, reality that must be documented, existing knowledge on a topic, and that is really uh, uh, obtained through literature review, uh, research questions, uh, we go to what you call theory building and uh, hypothesis specification, and uh, then we go to measurements, uh, then from there research design, and then data generation becomes an important bit, uh, data, data analysis, and assessing the goodness of findings and the research paper writing, ladies and gentlemen. Now, those are the things that we've gone through, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I would really want to Im invite you our, to our second lecture 
and uh, scholarly, scholarly writing for publication. And our next lecture will uh, try to present a brief description of various terms uh, used in academic research. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can say stay well, stay safe. I wish you a nice time. Bye.